No, uh, no evening on, on campus for the school as we complete without, uh, without a lecture to kind of invite you into that world. So if we could, uh, could transition to that, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for the evening. He's come a long way to be with us. Uh, so without taking any more time, I'll just say a few words uh, of, of what we'll be hearing in, in the hour or so ahead. Uh, tonight we're joined by Dr. Daniel Falk, uh, who's been here many times with us on campus. Tonight he's coming to us from uh, Penn State University where he is Professor of Classics and Ancient Mediterranean Studies, and he holds the post of the Chaikin Family Chair in Jewish Studies. Dr. Falk's research encompasses many topics that converge on the Dead Sea Scrolls, including uh, items such as the development of prayer and liturgy, the interpretation of scripture, and the formation of religious communities in antiquity. His publications on these topics include uh, many items, just a few if I could highlight, uh, text editions, uh, in, uh, certain Dead Sea Scrolls fragments in the Discoveries in the Judean Desert series, as well as several edited and authored books, uh, such as his 1998 volume of Brill, Daily Sabbath and Festival Prayers in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as a 2007 volume, uh, The Parabiblical Text, Strategies for Extending the Scriptures in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, not only is Daniel an incredible and well-established scholar, uh, he's a wonderful collaborator, uh, and I enjoyed very much working with him, as did Kyung in this project. Uh, he was uh, enthusiastic when we first presented this idea to him a couple years ago to invite him uh, to, to work on this project with us. Uh, and we uh, gleaned so much from your experience and wisdom in that, so thanks for being part of that. Um, tonight, Dan will be speaking on, on the, uh, the topic, uh, the paper is Why Repent? The Scriptural Motivation for Penitential Prayer in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So welcome back to campus. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here. It is an honor to dedicate this paper to dear friend and colleague, the irrepressible and irre unreplaceable Peter Flynn. He was a peerless evangelist and apologist for scholarship on the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls. No one who ever met this charming and energetic man could ever forget his passionate argument that Dead Sea Scrolls lectures should generate more excitement than a Britney Spears concert. <laughs> a little dated by now, but uh, even at the time he made it, it was already dated. <laughs> I'll refrain from uh, trying to dive into the mosh pit or asking you to do the wave. None of us could match Peter's charism. The topic of my talk tries to combine two scholarly interests of Peter's, Bible as scripture and Bible as liturgy. Before I carry on, can everyone hear me? Is the mic okay? Adjust the mic yes. a little bit. Yes, it needs some adjustment. This, should I use this one here, or, or should I be using this? Let's try this out here. Does that work? Testing, testing, okay. testing. Okay. All right, great. The synagogue liturgy with its democratic focus on word and prayer as a service of the people, is one of the great religious innovations giving shape to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And through these, have, uh, having great <coughs> impact on Western civilization. We tend to take these developments for granted and fail to recognize how astonishing they are and how unobvious. Let us consider, though, that despite the many regulations of ritual life in the Hebrew Bible, there is not a single law or regulation about prayer. Many people are a bit startled when, the, when they first reflect uh, that. We have laws about a great deal of things, but uh, no laws saying that you must pray, or that you must pray in a, in a certain way or a certain time. People prayed when they felt the need, at times of great crisis, fear, guilt, or joy. If we fast forward to about 200 CE and the Mishnah, an early rabbinic collection of law, abruptly begins, from what time in the evening must one recite the Shema? And it begins with a set of laws and regulations about uh, prayer. Uh, the time and circumstances for prayer as a religious obligation of the community. Now, if you jump there straight from the Hebrew Bible, you get a bit of whip whiplash. Uh, we don't experience that because we're very accustomed to the idea of, uh, of, of, of prayer as, a, uh, as an idea that uh, the, the community has some obligation to, to carry out. 
The idea that the community is obligated to pray every day, disconnected from particular experiences of need, is surprising. Why should one confess sins at set times every day, even if one has no consciousness of having sinned? We're going to focus on this latter question uh, by examining the meaning of prayer in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Why the Dead Sea Scrolls? Because they give us a large body of prayers and our best evidence for how a particular community of Jews prayed around the time of Jesus. It needs to be said that they were unusual in how and why they prayed. So uh, we should not necessarily imagine that all Jews prayed uh, the way they did or for the reasons they did. But they do give us valuable clues as to how Jews thought about prayer and why it might be important. A common explanation for why Jews began to see it as an obligation of the community to gather daily to pray is that prayer is a, uh, is a, a replacement for sacrifice. That is, when one can no longer sacrifice, one can at least offer prayer. For example, with, re with reference to Hosea um, uh, 14, which uh, reads, Take with you words and return to the Lord. Say to him, remove all guilt, accept that which is good, and we will compensate for bullocks with our lips. That is, our words, our prayers, substitute for uh, uh, sacrificial animals. We had, uh, in rabbinic literature, a great discussion about this uh, as a justification for the development of the synagogue liturgy and the system of, of prayers. So Rabbi Abahu said, how are we to compensate God for the bullocks we used to offer? Our lips will pay by means of the prayer we offer to you. Rabbi, Rabbi Isaac said, prayer is the means of expiation. In return for prayer, you grant expiation for our sinful lives. So such statements are of interest for exploring the rabbinic understanding of the significance of prayer. But they're of limited historical value for the origins of regularized prayer. They don't necessarily tell us why uh, this development happened. But they do tell us, in hindsight, how the rabbis thought about uh, and, and taught about why one should pray. But for the question of how uh, and why this developed, the Dead Sea Scrolls are probably our most valuable source because they provide the first clear examples of regulated prayer. Not surprisingly, scholars have tended to focus on the idea of prayer as replacement for sacrifice as the key motivation for regulated prayer in the Qumran Scrolls. Perhaps the rabbinic discussion has exerted undue influence on the historical interpretation of these texts. This is not to ignore the, main, the many pieces of evidence in the scrolls that suggest a correlation between prayer and sacrifice, which is essentially of three kinds. First, there are sharp criticisms of the temple cult, uh, criticizing it as corrupt or um, uh, desecrated, etc and also expressions of the community as fulfilling the role of atonement in cultic worship in its prayers and, and deeds. Secondly, we have numerous passages which speak of prayer as a sacrifice or prayer instead of sacrifice. And third, the fixed times for prayer, uh, daily, Sabbath, on festivals, can be seen to correspond to times of prayer. Nevertheless, to say that prayer is the replacement for sacrifice while indicated in many of the Qumran texts, does not exhaust the complicated and nuanced place of prayer within the scrolls and for the community, and does not necessarily explain the originating motivation. So in what follows, I'm going to give a sort of general introduction to, to the Dead Sea Scrolls, focusing on, on uh, the prayer material, um, but then take up that one question. Uh, I'm not going to explore all of uh, how prayer functioned in, in, in the scrolls. I think I'll cut it off before then, um, but we will focus on um, ideas related to um, the, or the origination of uh, penitential prayer and, and repentance. Just to the east of the ruins of Qumran lies a cemetery where some 2,000 people are buried. The graves remind us that real people lived here, people who left homes, families, personal wealth, perhaps positions of, of importance, and moved to the wilderness. The community at, of, at Qumran seems to have been one settlement for a large sectarian community. It was not easy to join the Essenes, nor was it an easy life. The initiation process was grueling. 
Over a period of at least two years, they would be examined to determine if they were among those destined by God to, to belong to the kingdom of light. Life in the community involved long days of work and strict rules with severe penalties. Given that this was a volunteer community, we must understand that this way of life worked for its members, that they found it compelling and meaningful. Prominent in, in this way of life was a comprehensive cycle of prayer. This life of prayer mattered to them. It was an important part of how they lived in the world, how they sought to correct what they believed to be wrong and to bring heaven into the here and now. So I want to reflect on the meaning of prayer for this distinctive sectarian community that lived two millennia ago. Of the thousands of members of this movement during roughly two centuries of its existence, we know of only a handful of names. We will pick Kony, a name mentioned on a scrap of pottery that records Kony transferring property and possessions to a certain Eleazar. According to one interpretation, this may have been a gift of property to the community when Honey became a member. And I can already hear Kip saying, it's a forgery. <laughs> <laughs> Why did Honey, and it doesn't matter if it is, we're just using the name. Why did Honey join this movement? How was this way of life more meaningful for him? And in particular, why, what did his practice of prayer mean for him? As in a scene, Honey would have bracketed every day with communal prayer at sunrise and sunset, as times ordained by God for prayer. Moreover, the community would have devoted a third of every night to reading scripture together, deliberating together about laws and praying together. According to the community rule, a sort of manifesto of the sectarian group. This was among the most important activities for this movement and central to their core identity and purpose. So Honey would have risen early each morning to gather with his congregation for prayer at sunrise and again at sunset, and also for a long prayer session during the night, in addition to prayers at meals. What sort of prayers? For one thing, at sunrise and sunset, it seems that Honey would have carried out a ritual somewhat similar to what we know as the Shema, one of the central prayers of the synagogue liturgy. He would have recited the Ten Commandments and other biblical passages about the obligation to be loyal to God and to meditate on God's law day and night. He would have worn tiny leather pouches on his head and arm containing these passages. About three dozen of these pouches, known as tefillin, were found at Qumran. Uh, but they've disappeared from, from the screen. There they are. He would also have recited blessings to God together with his congregation. We have a scroll of such prayers from Qumran with different blessings to God for sunset and sunrise each day of a month. Scholars refer to this scroll as 4Q503 daily prayers. In these blessings, the, uh, the community praises God, especially for the creation and daily renewal of the lights. The prayers pay close attention to the waxing and waning of the moon, each day noting the parts of light and darkness. They emphasize joining with angels in praising God. There are also two, collection, two copies of a different collection of daily prayers entitled Words of the Luminaries. This collection has a single long and elaborate prayer for each day of the week with confession of sin and petitions for physical and spiritual needs. On Sabbath, however, is a song of praise. Honey would have recited hymns of praise to God each day at sunrise and sunset, and especially during the nighttime prayer sessions, although it is less clear which and how many. Various passages mention daily songs of praise to God, and there are numerous scrolls with hymns of various kinds. I'll describe some of these later. So Honey would have spent a good deal of time in communal prayer every day. It was part of a systematic cycle of prayer and regarded as an essential part of one's religious vocation. Essenes were renowned for their especially high reverence for the Sabbath. In their prayers on Sabbath, it seems that they avoided petition and focused instead on joining the angels in praising God. In the collections of, pr of daily prayers mentioned earlier, the prayers for Sabbath focused on special motifs, including rest, holiness of God's name, God as king, and union of the angels, or union with the angels. 
But there was also a remarkable collection of mystical songs known as the Songs of the Sabbath Sacrifice that seemed to have been a very important set of prayers for Honey's community. Honey's community also would have recited special prayers at each of the festivals and fasts throughout the year. The sect followed a distinctive calendar of 364 days, which they believed reflected the perfect order um, created by God. So their festival prayers would have set them radically apart from other Jews in the very fact that they observed them on different days, and they observed some different festivals than other Jews. On the other hand, the only collection of festival prayers found at Qumran shows no sectarian concerns or features. It emphasizes typical Jewish motifs focusing on all Israel and the covenant with the patriarchs and Moses. In the prayers, the community confesses sin, asks God for forgiveness and help, and expresses joy and praise appropriate to the festival. One festival stood out above all others for Honi's community, the Festival of Weeks, or Pentecost. At this festival, the community celebrated a renewal of their covenant with God in the most solemn and dramatic ritual of the year for the sect. New members were admitted, existing members reaffirmed their place in the covenant, and apostates and outsiders were expelled. Priests and Levites recited blessings and curses. The people confessed their sins and pledged allegiance to God. In addition to these prayers at set times of the calendar, there were many other prayers for all sorts of occasions. There were scrolls of prayers for ritual purifications. The sect placed an extremely high importance on living in a state of ritual purity, since the sectarian community was deemed to be a holy sanctuary. Unique to this sect, as far as we know, are prayer, special prayers for the regular purification rites, which include <coughs> confession of sin. And in this way, uh, the purification rituals that we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls are remarkably similar to what we see uh, with John the Baptist. Uh, this has been quite a remarkable thing to notice. Uh, if you read the Gospels and you come across the story of John the Baptist and he calls people to repent and be baptized, um, maybe we don't uh, ponder how odd that is because we're so used to the concept of baptism. But there's no precedent for this at all in the Hebrew Bible. There are ritual purifications that you do for various things, uh, but none of these are regarded as, as sinful and you don't need to repent of them. Uh, if a woman gives birth to a child, you need to undergo ritual purification. That's not a sin that she had a child. If you have contact with a dead body, if someone in your family dies and you help prepare the body for, for burial, that requires a lengthy ritual purification, but that's not sin, and you don't repent of it. So this idea of, 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 of bathing a ritual bath for, uh, that's related to repentance and purification from sin is without any precedent in the Hebrew Bible, uh, but it is attested in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in John the Baptist, which may reflect some sort of um, connection uh, there. Uh, it draws on images from, from the Hebrew Bible, uh, the metaphor of washing as a purification from sin. But this is uh, uh, a, a new sort of ritual that uh, certain groups uh, developed to uh, uh, reinforce this idea of, of uh, needing to get right with God. There are also many examples of exorcism prayers for use by the liturgical master of the community known as the Maskeel, and also many songs uh, to ward off demons and evil. Uh, these would not be rare. Honey would have used these regularly to protect himself and his community. A number of scrolls also contain various hymns and prayers related to eschatological events, prayers and hymns uh, for the final battles between the forces of light and darkness, and blessings for the messianic age. Although these may be utopian writings, and uh, Marty and I have lots of conversations because we're working on a scroll where I have some festival prayers on one side and a copy of Marty's uh, war scroll is on the other side. It's a very interesting scroll. Uh, what's the connection between this collection of uh, uh, the, this text about an eschatological war and um, festival prayers? And I, I think possibly, and we still need to discuss this lots, that it may indicate that at least for the person who owned this scroll, the war scroll uh, was seen as, as uh, related to, to liturgy and, and uh, the recitation of prayers. But 
but we'll never know the answer to that. Although these may be utopian writings, it is likely that these were used liturgically in the present somehow, as the community acted out in the present their convictions with regard to the future. Finally, there are many other scrolls of hymns and prayers for which it is impossible to determine a precise use. Taken together, it is a staggering collection of liturgical material covering all facets of life. Honey's community believed it was their religious obligation to pray as a community at particular times, which they understood as ordained by God. It is a comprehensive system of prayer that embraces all of life. In this, it is very similar to the idea of prayer in the later synagogue. And there are some significant similarities with prayers in the later synagogue liturgy. If we consider the basic type, uh, the basic types of prayer that the community is to recite each day, it maps fairly well onto the daily prayers of the synagogue. Recital of the Shema, morning and evening. Morning and evening blessings to God, especially for the renewal of light. Petitionary prayers that include both physical and spiritual needs, including repentance and forgiveness, and songs of praise. Moreover, there is a similar impulse to frame prayers with blessings at the beginning and end, and for the theme of the prayer to be related to the occasion. There are even some similarities between Qumran prayers and prayers at the synagogue in terms of motifs and wording. Nevertheless, there's no direct connection here, no direct link between the prayers found at Qumran and the synagogue liturgy. It's not that this led directly or that the rabbis you know, just sort of picked up uh, the prayers that this group were, were reciting. They're still fundamentally different prayers, and the systems of prayer cycles differ. As far as we know, the Essenes were the first Jewish movement to develop such a comprehensive cycle of prayers. And the Jewish historian Josephus seems to imply this as well. I am interested here in the particular meaning of these prayers in the context of Honi's community. Why would Honi choose to commit himself to this religious life? What would these rituals mean for him? The system of prayer was part of a comprehensive way of life that Honi chose. Why might this way of life have been more appealing to Honi than what was on offer among the Pharisees or the Sadducees? Again, I'm not going to try to answer that, that uh, question broadly. I'm going to focus on uh, again, the, the question of a certain type of prayer. In the first place, I want to examine ways in which the various prayers as a ritual both reflect and work out the mythology of Kony's community. By myth here, I mean uh, that which expresses the ideal of the way things ought to be and why the world is not that way. Ritual can be a way of navigating that gap between the way things are, the way that we experience things in the world, and the way we think that things ought to be. Uh, both responding and seeking to rectify, acting out the ideal in the midst of what is, bringing heaven to earth, as it were. The distinctive ideology of the Essenes that set them apart from other Jews include the following items. And here I'll just you know, briefly summarize some points. One, the idea that Israel is still in exile um, and under God's curse. Never mind the stories about uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and the return from Babylon to, to Israel. To this community, they said that's not the return. The exile did not end. The humiliations that the nation suffered uh, following on from that, uh, they were still uh, a subordinated uh, people, um, and under, under the Persians, and under the Greeks, and later under the Romans. This cannot be the end of the exile. This cannot be the end of the curse. We must still be under God's punitive hand. Um, secondly, that the temple is defiled. Uh, there was a functioning temple during the time period that we're dealing with, uh, but it seems at least that they regarded this as, as impure or uh, not functioning correctly. And so it seems that they didn't participate in it. There's some questions about that. Did they participate to some degree or not? Uh, but at any rate, it seems that they, did, they were not full participants in what happened at the temple. Thirdly, that God is in complete control. Um, so here we have in the scrolls a, a very strict determinism. The way things work in the world is the way that God plans them to be. Um, and so history is an unfolding of this divine plan. Uh, it, they look forward to a, uh, a future judgment when God will destroy evil and establish uh, good. And, and finally, that the... Uh, 
were caught up in a great cosmic struggle between two camps, the, the forces of good or light and the forces of evil or darkness. And God created things that way. Um, and these are intention until uh, the end times when God will uh, defeat the forces of evil or darkness and establish light. Um, now when we look at their prayers and their ritual life, we can see how Honey and his community worked out their understanding of the world and their place in it. They believe that Israel is still in exile and under God's wrath. Their entire liturgical life and their community's primary reason for being was devoted to rectifying this, atoning for the land and restoring Israel. Uh, so for example, uh, in the sort of manifesto, when these are in Israel, the council of the community shall be established in truth. It shall be an everlasting plantation, a temple for Israel, a most holy assemble for Aaron, who shall atone for the land. So note the, the temple and sacrifice language there used of the community. But if the community regarded the temple as defiled and so did not take part in sacrifices there, how did they atone for sins? This is a complicated question as different passages talk about atonement in very different ways. For our purposes, the best answer is that it is the entirety of their communal life and their ritual life. So that some passages refer to the community as a whole, as a living temple. Um, activities specifically des described as atoning for sin include their corrective uh, adherence to Torah. So working out the law correctly, that atones for sins. The activities of interpreting Torah and deciding judgments discipline of members and humble submission to God's judgment, um, and repentance and prayer. Now they had biblical precedent that unjust sacrifice was an offense to God, and that God preferred justice, mercy, obedience, and humble prayer. Moreover, there are two strands of biblical tradition about expunging the curse of exile. So how does one get out from under this, uh, this, this curse that they're under? They regard the exile as continuing. How does one end that? One strand is found in Deuteronomy, in what scholars refer to as the Deuteronomistic tradition. This tradition treats the relationship between God and Israel as a covenant, sort of like a contract between landlord and tenant. When the people fail to keep the terms of the contract, there are penalties, up to and including eviction from their property, that is, exile from the land. Even then, though, all is not lost. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 30 offer a prescription for how the people can, re can reverse these penalties and regain possession of the land. They must seek um, the Lord with all their heart and soul and return to the Lord and obey him. Then God will restore them to their land, help them to be better tenants, and instead kick out their troublesome neighbors. The key mechanism here is, uh, that's described in Deuteronomy is turning and seeking. What it, what it means to seek and return, though, is not defined. But in Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings 8, these are interpreted as repentance and prayer, as the enactment of repentance. Thus, seek is apparently interpreted as supplication, to seek God's will uh, for, on behalf of the nation. The second strand is found in priestly traditions about confession. Leviticus 26 instructs that when the people find themselves exiled as punishment for sin, quote, if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their ancestors, then God will forgive them their sin and the land will be atoned and the people return to the land. In both cases, sacrifice plays no role in this restoration. But this is because the imagined situation is that of exile, where the people do not have temple or sacrifice. These traditions had a powerful influence on Honi's community. They believed that the exile had never ended. They considered that the humiliations of the Jews uh, under the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans were evidence that they were still suffering penalties for being bad tenants, even if they had managed to sneak back in and squat in their old days. So what was wrong? They were convinced that the people had never truly fulfilled the prescription of turning and seeking. Other Jews believe this as well, as we see a similar perspective in the book of Daniel, the book of Jubilees, and probably also John the Baptist. There's a reason that John the Baptist led uh, his followers down to the Jordan River 
on the boundaries of the community, had them repent before they crossed the river back into the land. Basically, he's taking them out, saying, we don't belong here. We need to repent before we could be in the land. We don't know that that's exactly what's going on, but that's sure what it looks like. Honey's community understood return and seek in a distinctive way. For them, it means penitential prayer and study of scripture. This is what needed to be done to restore the nation. The Yachad took it upon themselves to atone for the land by penitential prayer and study of Torah, which they would do daily as a, as a community. In this way, their life of prayer and study was a ritual remedy um, and an antidote for exile, as well as a vaccine against it happening again. So in one respect, this could support the idea of prayer as replacement for sacrifice as a means of atonement when there is no temple. But there's two difficult questions that remain. First, if this was the whole story, why is it that the evidence we have for the development of communal prayer is not during the exile when the temple was in ruins, but after the return from the exile, in connection with the rebuilt temple, sacrifices, and festivals? That is, when we look at the biblical stories about where we get uh, this tradition developing, it's around the, the rebuilt temple, uh, in the, particularly in the accounts of Ezra and Nehemiah. Second, what is the explanation for regular prayer of the community and not just one big uh, uh, festival of, of repentance? So we need to dig a bit deeper. And the place to start is with the priestly theory of how confession works to remove sin, as studied by Jacob Milgram. As described in Leviticus and Numbers, ordinarily in ancient Israel, sacrifice removes sin. Um, this is the mechanism for repairing the relationship between God and humans. When humans uh, break the, the, uh, the, the covenant, uh, they offer sacrifices, and this uh, restores the relationship. But in cases of willful and flagrant trespassing on God's property and violation of the terms of the covenant, sacrifice alone is not sufficient. The people must first express remorse and confess their sins, thus converting the offense to an unintentional offense and make amends. Then sacrifice can expunge the offense. So the Day of Atonement is perhaps uh, the, most, uh, uh, the best known example of this. The sins of the nation are confessed over a goat before uh, sacrifice takes place. But it is also attested in cases of deliberate false vows um, and oaths in Leviticus 5 and Numbers 5. That is, in effect, sacrifice can only address second-degree crimes. First-degree crimes require confession plus sacrifice. Leviticus 26 understands the violation of the covenant that led to exile as a deliberate trespass against God. So in, in reflecting on why are the people in exile, what went wrong, um, they regard this as uh, so grievous because they had deliberately uh, trespassed against God. And it prescribes the following for the nation in exile, humbling themselves, confessing sin, and making reparation. Thus, uh, there is no um, sacrifice mentioned because the people uh, have no temple in exile. The amends that the people make is their eviction from the land so that the land can rest. That is, the, this remedy for exile corresponds to this priestly theory uh, where normally sacrifice and confession work together. Sacrifice is just missing because they're in exile. In the Second Temple period, these two strands of tradition, the uh, turn and seek, or the uh, repentance and, uh, and uh, penitential prayer, combined with this uh, tradition of confession, of uh, cultic confession, which works to uh, alleviate sin. In the book of Ezra, for example, Ezra's prayer is described in ways that show that it draws on both of these traditions. But his prayer is offered at the temple at the time of the evening sacrifice. And the congregation atone for their sin by confessing their sin and offering a sin offering. In the book of Baruch, the people in Babylon do, humble, do acts of humbling and prayer. And they collect money to send to Jerusalem as sacrifices. Uh, in the prayer of Azariah, another uh, text from the Apocrypha, 
there is petition for God to accept a contrite heart and humble spirit as sacrifice to atone, since they have no altar. Quote, such may our sacrifice be in your sight today, end quote. One should assume that if there was an altar, the response would be to confess and make sacrifice. The text cited are of diverse genre and setting and appropriate and appropriate the penitential prayer tradition for different purposes. But they all reflect varying ways of combining these two traditions um, and, and uh, a, a perspective where what is necessary for reversing the exile requires humbling, confessing sin, making reparation, and where possible, sacrifice. There are plausible grounds then to argue that the development of the penitential prayer tradition in the Second Temple period was influenced by a priestly legal tradition in which confession would normally work together with sacrifice to atone for deliberate sin against God. But theoretically, at least, uh, what we're dealing with here is uh, uh, a, a, a system where uh, uh, confession would work together with sacrifice, but in circumstances where you can't sacrifice, uh, uh, confession alone is starting to uh, uh, take the place. And so we're starting to see some space for uh, uh, penitential prayer on its own. <coughs> It's perhaps worth raising one further speculative thought. Um, Jacob Milgram deals with the psychology of fear of unconscious sin. And we find this in many texts, the idea that maybe I have sinned unintentionally. Uh, perhaps you can think of the example in the book of Job, where Job is so concerned that his children might um, have accidentally sinned, that he offers sacrifices for them. One's suffering then is imagined to result from having trespassed against God unintentionally. So the response could be to offer sacrifice in case. Uh, the growing importance of this is, uh, is, is seen in, in uh, uh, numerous uh, texts which talk about uh, you know, offering sacrifices in case or the idea of uh, uh, prayer um, uh, just in case. Could this provide a psychological and social context for understanding the ultimate extension um, to daily confession of, of sins? So the problem we're wrestling with here is how does that start within the community? Uh, this idea that one should confess sins daily. So let's return to Honey's community. Without going into details, there's abundant evidence that this theory of how to deal with deliberate trespass against God was important to the priestly community of the Yachad. They reflected on both strands turn and seek, uh, and confession, both in relation to prayer and in interpreting um, law. Most striking is their insistence that atonement for land is a central function of the community. This is what they exist to do, um, is to somehow reverse the curse that is on the land. And the most important passage uh, that we've already referred to is at the beginning of this manifesto uh, known as the rule of the community, where the community is described as constituting a most holy sanctuary to pay for sin by works of judgment and suffering affliction and to atone for the land. Um, atoning for the land would seem to be shorthand for an interpretation that the people's absence from the land is making amends for uh, violation against God. The movements represented by these writings regarded that those amends to be incomplete. So although the people were back in the land, um, they regarded we're still under God's uh, curse. And moreover, to be compounded by the everyday uh, sins of, of the people. So the Yachad uh, believed it had a temporary role to play in atoning for sins on behalf of the nation. Exactly what uh, activities they regarded as atoning is not entirely clear, but we saw some of them already, certainly uh, penitential uh, prayer. Uh, but beyond that, it, it is their entire existence as a community which uh, brings uh, atoning for uh, the, the land. 
And in this way, there are some parallels to what we find in early Christianity, the idea of the community as a temple, which uh, uh, is, got, uh, is a divine presence uh, in the land, but also makes uh, atonement. What I've been trying to deal with here is some uh, aspects of the background of a, of a development of a tradition which becomes very important within Judaism and then Christianity and, and Islam, where the community prays regularly uh, for um, not only uh, specific issues that are known to it uh, when crises arise, etc., uh, but a regularity to prayer and prayer as a, an obligation of the, of the community. And uh, what I've tried to do is explore some of the resources that are behind that. There are various uh, biblical traditions which talk about uh, uh, repenting and turning to God. And these develop in different ways throughout the tradition. Um, what I would like to do, though, is reflect a little bit on something I don't normally do in um, in talks. And I probably should do more. I think uh, as academics, we. Uh, rarely reflect on why we study a certain topic. Um, you might well wonder, what is the point of studying uh, minutia of uh, uh, developments uh, within uh, ancient texts? And I'm particularly anxious with regard to the Dead Sea Scrolls this way, because I know that many people view it as a way of sort of connecting with uh, the biblical text, the biblical tradition. Perhaps it unlocks secrets to our tradition. Uh, uh, perhaps it gives us examples to follow or to avoid. Concerning this talk, uh, dealing with the development of ancient uh, prayer and prayer traditions in, uh, in ancient Judaism, does this reveal the real meaning behind our prayer? Uh, we are, uh, our praying communities. Uh, what are we to make of studying uh, the prayer traditions of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, do they tell us how to pray? Uh, the real meaning behind our prayer? Or how, what should be the meaning? For example, uh, do they reveal that uh, behind our penitential prayer is really uh, atoning for the sins of the nation? No. These texts are not about you and me. Uh, these are other texts. There are texts about a people who lived a long time ago who are not like us. Um, I'm constantly aware that I would not like these people. Uh, and they would not like me. Uh, they certainly wouldn't like me. Uh, there is much within the scrolls that is repulsive, uh, as well as things that we might find attractive. Now, is our job then to be looking for things that, um, that tell us how we should behave or how we should not behave? No, I think our primary, the primary value of studying this material is to simply understand people who are different than us. Um, and uh, that there is some uh, connection. We, we can find some similarities. But let me separate out two, two different tasks here, uh, which I think is very important because they often get conflated. Why do I study this stuff? Why do um, those who are scholars study this material? Is it because they show us um, how we ought to think or how we ought to live? Um, no. In the first instance, it's simply to understand. Um, so why I'm interested in studying the history of, of um, ancient Jewish uh, prayer in these traditions is to answer a fairly simple question, where, when, uh, how, why did these traditions develop? We have a rich trove of prayer texts. So my question is, is this relevant to the development of uh, prayer traditions in uh, Judaism more broadly and hence to Christianity as well? Or are they irrelevant? Um, to settle that, I need to know something about where early Jewish traditions come from. I need to be able to compare and contrast uh, so there can be an enormous amount of work to uncover a very, very tiny little piece. And, uh, but that is valuable. I would separate entirely from that uh, the question of what's the upshot? What's the takeaway from this? What, what should I take uh, away from this, this sort of uh, lecture? 
The academic question, that takes a long time to sort of unpack and, and unravel in terms of its influence uh, to what it means to us. Uh, but what about for us? As we just approach uh, a, a topic like the early development of prayer. Um, first of all, there are things that are admirable and noble uh, in, in these people. Um, and there are things that are very distasteful and repugnant. Um, but at the end of the day, these are people who are living in troubled times. Uh, and their faith helps them make sense of uh, the world and how they should live in it. In that sense, they're not so different from us. Uh, one point that I really want to make, though, is that if we're honest, uh, we can begin to realize that we are as mixed up as they are. Uh, there is this mixture of the good and the bad. Uh, we can tend to look at other religious traditions and say, uh, I don't like that. Uh, maybe this little bit is OK, but I really don't like that. But to assume that what we have uh, comes from God. Um, and come straight down, and uh, this is the way it ought to be. Well, it ain't. Uh, the way that they lived uh, their religious life did not come straight from heaven, even though they presented it that way. Uh, religious communities, including our own, tend to present things that way as well. Uh, we live this way because that's the way it was revealed to be. Um, it's not. Uh, the way we live in the world, the way we work our religion is because we're human. Um, and that is going to mean that it has this mixture of, of good and bad. Uh, the reasons that we give for doing things, the reasons that we do uh, certain things, uh, vary because of how we wrestle with the tradition. So what we see in, in, in the scrolls, we can see lots of different explanations for why they pray. We can try to unpack the influences there. We can try to unpack how that has influences later within Judaism and Christianity and Islam. Uh, but that doesn't give us uh, a, an absolute answer. Uh, this is why uh, one should pray. This is why all people pray or anything like that. So what I think is uh, extremely valuable in studying an ancient uh, society is because it does hold up a mirror to ourselves. If we are honest, we can begin to, to see um, that there is this combination of uh, the beauty and the deep insights. We can see it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of their prayers are absolutely beautiful. You could take those and stick them into a, into, into a church or a synagogue today, uh, and they would be wonderful um, and, uh, and, and, and deep and powerful, and we would all say amen. Um, there are other uh, things that can sound good, uh, but then when you probe them, you realize, <coughs> oh, I don't like that at all. Let me give you just one example. Um, in uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, in one of the texts we looked at, the community rule, we have a reflection of um, the, the passage uh, in Deuteronomy 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Um, that's all wonderful. But then in the following text, they unpack what that means. And that means, uh, you know, how does one love God with all one's heart, etc.? Um, that means not only to love those who one recognizes are part of one's community, but to hate, actively hate, with an eternal hatred, everyone else. That is, this group felt that uh, it was divinely revealed that they should hate the Pharisees, they should hate um, all other Jews, they should hate certainly all Gentiles, they would certainly hate us. Uh, and we might find that shocking. And if we uh, knew a church that, that believed that, we would probably have problems with it. Um, uh, but we can start to notice uh, that there is that combination of things that we would uh, acknowledge as, as wonderful insights and parts that um, uh, can be distasteful. And I think that can reflect back on us. So I think one takeaway in, in trying to explore uh, an ancient community is not to look for simple things where um, uh, they tell me how I should think or, or not. Uh, but to see that complexity, see it as a mirror of ourselves and our community. Uh, and with that, I'll end. Thank you. I'm happy to take